Book 5, Chapter 8 Thou didst so deal with me, therefore, that I was persuaded to go to Rome and teach there what I had been teaching at Carthage. And how I was persuaded to do this, I will not omit to confess to thee, for in this also the profoundest workings of thy wisdom and thy constant mercy toward us must be pondered and acknowledged. I did not wish to go to Rome because of the richer fees and the higher dignity which my friends promised me there, though these considerations did affect my decision. My principal and almost sole motive was that I had been informed that the students there studied more quietly and were better kept under the control of stern discipline, so that they did not capriciously and impudently rush into the classroom of a teacher not their own. Indeed, they were not admitted at all without the permission of the teacher. At Carthage, on the contrary, there was a shameful and intemperate license among the students. They burst in rudely, and with furious gestures would disrupt the discipline which the teacher had established for the good of his pupils. Many outrages they perpetrated with astounding effrontery, things that would be punishable by law if they were not sustained by custom. Thus custom makes plain that such behavior is all the more worthless because it allows men to do what thy eternal law never will allow. They think that they act thus with impunity, though the very blindness with which they act is their punishment, and they suffer far greater harm than they inflict. The manners that I would not adopt as a student, I was compelled as a teacher to endure in others, and so I was glad to go where all who knew the situation assured me that such conduct was not allowed. But thou, O oh my refuge and my portion in the land of the living, didst goad me thus at Carthage, so that I might therefore be pulled away from it and change my worldly habitation for the preservation of my soul. At the same time, thou didst offer me at Rome an enticement, through the agency of men enchanted with this death in life, by their insane conduct in the one place and their empty promises in the other. To correct my wandering footsteps, thou didst secretly employ their perversity and my own. For those who disturbed my tranquillity were blinded by shameful madness, and also those who allured me elsewhere had nothing better than the earth's cunning. And I, who hated actual misery in the one place, sought fictitious happiness in the other. Thou knewest the cause of my going from one country to the other, O God, but thou didst not disclose it either to me or to my mother who grieved deeply over my departure and followed me down to the sea. She clasped me tight in her embrace, willing either to keep me back or to go with me. But I deceived her, pretending that I had a friend whom I could not leave until he had a favorable wind to set sail. Thus I lied to my mother and such a mother and escaped. For this too thou didst mercifully pardon me, fool that I was and didst preserve me from the waters of the sea for the water of thy grace, so that when I was purified by that, the fountain of my mother's eyes, from which she had daily watered the ground for me as she prayed to thee, should be dried. And, since she refused to return without me, I persuaded her, with some difficulty, to remain that night in a place quite close to our ship, where there was a shrine in memory of the blessed Cyprian. That night, I slipped away secretly, and she remained to pray and weep. And what was it, O Lord, that she was asking of thee in such a flood of tears, but that thou wouldst not allow me to sail? But thou, taking thy own secret counsel, and noting the real point to her desire, didst not grant what she was then asking, in order to grant to her the thing that she had always been asking. The wind blew and filled our sails, and the shore dropped out of sight. Wild with grief, she was there the next morning, and filled thy ears with complaints and groans which thou didst disregard, although at the very same time thou wast using my longings as a means and wast hastening me on the fulfillment of all longing. Thus the earthly part of her love to me was justly purged by the scourge of sorrow. Still, 
like all mothers, though even more than others, she loved to have me with her, and did not know what joy thou was preparing for her through my going away. Not knowing this secret end, she wept and mourned, and saw in her agony the inheritance of Eve, seeking in sorrow what she had brought forth in sorrow, and yet, after accusing me of perfidy and cruelty, she continued her intercession for me to thee. She returned to her own home, and I went on to Rome. Chapter 9 And lo, I was received in Rome by the scourge of bodily sickness, and I was very near to fallen into hell, burdened with all the many and grievous sins I had committed against thee, myself, and others, all over and above that fetter of original sin whereby we all die in Adam. For thou hast given me none of these things in Christ, neither had he abolished by his cross the enmity that I had incurred from thee through my sins. For how could he do so by the crucifixion of a phantom, which was all I supposed him to be? The death of my soul was as real then as the death of his flesh appeared to me unreal, and the life of my soul was as false, because it was as unreal as the death of his flesh was real, though I believed it not. My fever increased, and I was on the verge of passing away and perishing, for, if I had passed away then, where should I have gone but into the fiery torment which my misdeeds deserved, measured by the truth of thy rule? My mother knew nothing of this, yet far away she went on praying for me, and thou, present everywhere, didst hear her where she was, and had pity on me where I was, so that I regained my bodily health, although I was still disordered in my sacrilegious heart. For that peril of death did not make me wish to be baptized. I was even better when, as a lad, I entreated baptism of my mother's devotion, as I have already related and confessed. But now I had since increased in dishonor, and I madly scoffed at all the purposes of thy medicine which would not have allowed me, though a sinner such as I was, to die a double death. Had my mother's heart been pierced with this wound, it never could have been cured, for I cannot adequately tell of the love she had for me, or how she still travailed for me in the spirit with a far keener anguish than when she bore me in the flesh. I cannot conceive, therefore, how she could have been healed if my death, still in my sins, had pierced her inmost love. Where, then, would have been all her earnest, frequent, and ceaseless prayers to thee? Nowhere but with thee. But couldst thou, O most merciful God, despise the contrite and humble heart of that pure and prudent widow who was so constant in her arms, so gracious and attentive to thy saints, never missing a visit to church twice a day, morning and evening? And this not for vain gossiping nor old wives' fables, but in order that she might listen to thee in thy sermons and thou to her in her prayers? Couldst thou, by whose gifts she was so inspired, despise and disregard the tears of such a one without coming to her aid, those tears by which she entreated thee, not for gold or silver, and not for any changing or fleeting good, but for the salvation of the soul of her son? By no means, O Lord. It is certain that thou wouldst near, and wast hearing, and wast carrying out the plan by which thou hast predetermined it should be done. Far be it from thee that thou should have deluded her in those visions and the answers she had received from thee, some of which I have mentioned, and others not, which she kept in her faithful heart, and forever beseeching, urge them on thee as if they had thy own signature. For thou, because thy mercy endureth for ever, hast so condescended to those whose debts thou hast pardoned, that thou likewise dost become a debtor by thy promises. Thou didst restore me then from that illness, and didst heal the son of thy handmaid in his body, that he might live for thee, and that thou mightest endow him with a better and more certain health. After this, at Rome, I again joined those deluding and deluded saints, and not their hearers only, 
such as the man was in whose house I had fallen sick, but also with those whom they called the elect. For it still seemed to me that it is not we who sin, but some other nature sinned in us. And it gratified my pride to be beyond blame, and when I did anything wrong, not to have to confess that I had done wrong, that thou mightest heal my soul because it had sinned against thee, and I loved to excuse my soul and to accuse something else inside me, I knew not what, but which was not I. But, assuredly, it was I, and it was my impiety that had divided me against myself. That sin, then, was all the more incurable because I did not deem myself a sinner. It was an execrable iniquity, O God omnipotent, that I would have preferred to have thee defeated in me to my destruction than to be defeated by thee to my salvation. Not yet, therefore, hast thou set a watch upon my mouth and a door around my lips that my heart might not incline to evil speech to make excuse for sin with men that work iniquity. And, therefore, I continued still in the company of their elect. But now, hopeless of gaining any profit from that false doctrine, I began to hold more loosely and negligently even to those points which I had decided to rest content with if I could find nothing better. I was now half inclined to believe that those philosophers whom they called the academics were wiser than the rest in holding that we ought to doubt everything and in maintaining that man does not have the power of comprehending any certain truth, for, although I had not yet understood their meaning, I was fully persuaded that they thought just as they are commonly reputed to do. And I did not fail openly to dissuade my host from his confidence which I observed that he had in those fictions of which the works of many are full. For all this, I was still on terms of more intimate friendships with these people than with others who were not of their heresy. I did not indeed defend it with my former ardour, but my familiarity with that group, and there were many of them concealed in Rome at that time, made me slower to seek any other way. This was particularly easy, since I had no hope of finding in thy church the truth from which they had turned me aside, O Lord of heaven and earth, creator of all things visible and invisible. And it still seemed to me most unseemly to believe that thou couldst have the form of human flesh and be bounded by the bodily shape of our limbs. And when I desired to meditate on my God, I did not know what to think of but a huge extended body, for what did not have bodily extension did not seem to me to exist, and this was the greatest and almost the sole cause of my unavoidable errors. And thus, I also believed that evil was a similar kind of substance, and that it had its own hideous and deformed extended body, either in a dense form which they call the earth, or in a thin and subtle form as, for example, the substance of the air, which they imagined as some malignant spirit penetrating that earth. And because my piety, such as it was, still compelled me to believe that the good God never created any evil substance, I formed the idea of two masses, one opposed to the other, both infinite, but with the evil more contracted and the good more expensive. And from this diseased beginning, the other sacrileges followed after. For when my mind tried to turn back to the Catholic faith, I was cast down, since the Catholic faith was not what I judged it to be. And it seemed to me a greater piety to regard thee, my God, to whom I make confession of thy mercies, as infinite in all respects save that one, where the extended mass of evil stood opposed to thee, where I was compelled to confess that thou art finite, uh, than if I should think that thou should be confined by the form of a human body on every side. And it seemed better to me to believe that no evil had been created by thee, for in my ignorance evil appeared not only to be some kind of substance, but a corporeal one at that, 